I'd like to begin by speaking briefly of the relationship of the control program of the operating system 360 to the rest of the operating system. And in fact, the relationship of the control program to all of the users' programs that uh, may at any time be run in an installation. And the relationship is very similar to that of brick and mortar. It's the rest of the operating system, the Fortran compilers, the COBOL compilers, the sort programs, and so forth, as well as the user's payroll programs and uh, uh, other applications-oriented programs that provides the bricks. And it's the control program that is both used by them uh, as mortar, and also it's the control program that helps to build the structure and controlling the interrelationship of the component parts. Briefly, the three prime functions of the control program are to increase systems throughput and secondly to decrease turnaround time. And lastly, to provide a variety of services which allow the user, first of all, to handle his own problem more easily, and secondly, to better prepare the user for future growth within his uh, own application, within his own environment. By systems throughput, to define the terms, uh, what we mean is to increase the amount of work that can be done within a given amount of time if uh, we start off by knowing precisely what we have in the environment. If the environment has, for example, a computer of a certain speed, a certain number of channels, a certain number of I.O. devices, a certain size core, and so forth. By increasing systems throughput, we mean being able to produce more work within a fixed amount of time, given those other things as being fixed. By turnaround time, what we mean is reducing the amount of time from the moment that a job enters a machine shop until the answers are ready, and the user is able to receive his, uh, the results that he has asked for. You know, by increasing systems throughput, throughput we obviously do, uh, by necessity, decrease turnaround time because each job is being done faster. But there's an additional uh, component of turnaround time that will become clearer that we also expect to achieve. Uh, an, an effect that is considerably more than merely a measure of the increased performance of the system. Let me begin by discussing first uh, how a control program can in uh, increase systems throughput. Primarily, it can do this by reducing transition time between jobs or between programs. In an environment in which there is no control program or is no operating system, uh, we would find an operator being told to run uh, a sequence of several different programs, and prior to the run of each one of these, he would have to um, mount tapes, uh, set the cards in the card reader, begin the operation. The program would then be run, and at the end of that time, tapes would have to be demounted in order to make room for the new tapes required by the second program. There would be a considerable amount of time normally between program runs that is effectively wasted. And one of the uh, functions, one of the uh, motives of having a control program is to reduce this turnaround time. The way this is done is by providing uh, additional programs which will permit a batch job environment. In such an environment, what happens is that the various uh, requirements for process, uh, that is to say the, the several different programs, 10, 20, 30 programs, which uh, have been prepared and have entered the machine shop, are all stacked together. And uh, under the control of one of the control programs, uh, we process one and then another of these programs without operator intervention, except for the occasional necessity of mounting uh, special input tapes. Normally, the specialized input and output that um, would be required in a non-operating um, system environment is eliminated or at least minimized. What happens instead is that the users are encouraged to uh, take advantage of standard input tapes and standard output tapes, and in that fashion, reduce the amount of operator setup that is required between jobs. Now, in such an environment, first let me perhaps define some terms. When we do have a stack job environment, we recognize two different things. First of all, jobs, and secondly, job steps. By a job, we mean a collection of different programs that are to be run, usually coming from the same individual or the same department, uh, bearing the same account number, the same uh, billing code. 
Uh, on the other hand, within that application, there may be uh, a sequence of different and independent programs which um, must be run and sometimes uh, run a particular sequence. As an example of this, uh, we may have been presented with some source language statements and the intention is to introduce these to the Fortran compiler to go through the compilation process then perhaps to combine this compilation with other compilations that were previously uh, produced uh, and load them into the machine and then to use this in order to execute a job. So this is the compile, load, and go situation. These are three different and distinct job steps uh, all contained within the same job. They're all, they all have been submitted by the same user, they're all charged for the same account, but they can be recognized as being independent or relatively independent of one another. On the other hand, within a job, we may well, in fact, have certain dependency relationships set up. If we can't complete the compilation successfully, we presumably will not go on with uh, job steps two and three, the loading and go, the loading and execution. Now, with this in mind, uh, supposing the control program did provide for uh, the transition in between job steps and between jobs, how else could systems throughput be improved? I mean, how can we now are, just by the nature of uh, such a transitional monitor, we are producing more work, but what else can we do? One of the things that we can do is when uh, the application requires the use of sequential files, uh, that is to say, if it's making, for example, use of two different input files, one uh, a master file of some kind for payroll, and the other thing a set of time cards which have been sorted by employee number, when I have such an application which makes use of two files which are arranged in sequence and where the output itself is in sequence, then the control program can provide for a buffered operation, a means of reading ahead, uh, a means for independently pr uh, filling buffers, uh, reading uh, a number of different uh, transaction cards prior to, th to the time that they're needed so that when the uh, applications program, in fact, demands the next transaction record, it's already in core, rather than having to stop and begin the uh, I.O. operation in order to bring it into core. So this is one example now, and the first and elementary example, of an overlapped operation where we have two r somewhat independent things going on. One of them is, produced by the, or is provided for by the control program, and that is the maintenance of the buffers. The, it's the control program that uh, recognizes when uh, one of the buffer areas has been emptied, that is to say has been used by the operating program, and under independent control, it's the program that uh, initiates a new input operation in order to replenish the buffer. Uh, it's the uh, control program also which will receive the interrupt that indicates that the buffer has indeed been filled and uh, will keep track of that fact so that when uh, new information is required by the operating function, by the operating program, um, uh, it's the control program that will know whether or not the buffer has been filled and whether or not the data can be transferred. So what I've described here is an overlapped operation provided by the control program. If it weren't for this, if, in other words, if the user were himself to wait for each transaction to be required and then to initiate the I.O. operation, which is normally uh, rather slow, uh, then considerably more time would be taken. So systems throughput is increased by this overlapped operation. And the important thing to know about this aspect of the control program and uh, almost all other aspects is that this remains more or less a behind-the-scenes op operation the individual programmer can remain relatively unaware of wh just precisely what's going on. When the trap or the interrupt is received that indicates the new information has entered the machine, uh, he's unaware of, the, of the, the timing for the instructions that will begin a new I.O. operation. He can remain concerned exclusively with the uh, applications-oriented problem and can ignore some of the hardware interfaces as represented by input-output operations. Let me put this on the board, what we've so far discussed. Reducing transition time and managing buffered sequential files. Now what more might we do 
in order to increase systems throughput. Supposing that in a particular operation that we're handling, despite the buffered files, the program is acting too fast for the card reader, or the program is acting too fast for the output printer. In other words, supposing that uh, we are operating uh, some job that's essentially I.O. limited, and uh, the input-output devices can keep up with the computational speed. What could be done in such an environment? The thing that might be done is to first uh, transfer the basic input data onto some other form of input uh, medium, which can be read in faster. So that, for example, we could take the initial data which had been on cards and first put it on a magnetic tape, or we'll put it on uh, a disk, and read into the program from this faster speed I.O. device. And similarly, we could take the output data that the program produces and write it initially on some high-speed I.O. device and subsequently go from that device to the low-speed printer. On the other hand, if we should attempt to do this as a completely independent operation, since that uh, transfer from one medium to another itself requires CPU time, we wouldn't have saved anything. What must be done if we're to uh, save any time and increase systems throughput is to overlap this conversion process with productive work. Now, how might we do this? One technique would be to get another computer, which is reserved exclusively for peripheral use. The other alternative is to have this operation of transferring uh, from one I.O. medium to another take place concurrently with the main operation on precisely the same computer. So that a picture of that operation would look something like this. I may have a card reader. I may have two card readers. Each being read by the CPU. And I might then have that data being transferred over to a disk file. Uh, simultaneously with the fact that the CPU is processing some installation program, and the output from the CPU would again be written on the disk file, and from the disk file, as another independent operation, be written on one or more printers. So the flow is this way. Now, the reason that it's advantageous to do this on a single computer rather than, like, than on a peripheral computer is the fact that we are interested in turnaround time as well as in systems throughput. You recall that my definition of turnaround time, I say the amount of time between uh, the introduction of data into the machine shop and the receipt of the printed results should be decreased. Now, what we have over here, by use of a disk file, is the fact that as, as soon as a job enters the card reader, it can be processed if it's of sufficiently high uh, priority. It can go onto the disk file and immediately be processed. As soon as that uh, process is finished, it will be back on the disk file and can immediately be printed. There isn't the necessity to batch the inputs on a separate computer, and there isn't the necessity to batch the outputs and process them on a separate computer. We have, we're not required to stick within the batched environment so long as we're using a disk pack. And the information can flow in and immediately out during the operation of a program. So that, for example, a normal flow might be something like this. We might have two card readers going. And card reader one succeeds in uh, completing or, or reading all of the uh, input data associated with the first job in the stream. And that information is now on the disk. Concurrently with the reading of the first card reader, Card reader two is putting another job on the disk. And while that first job is being processed, the first card reader is reading a third job in terms of the overall number of jobs entering the system. And similarly, while that first job was processing in the CPU, output data was being written here. As soon as the output is completed, during the time that the second job from the disk was being read back to the CPU to process it, the first job can now be picked up and can be printed so that the total time between the introduction of the job uh, at the card reader and the time that a printed output is available is much reduced. There is no necessity of batching um, all of the inputs uh, together and on one machine and transferring this over to another machine and uh, uh, then batching all of the outputs uh, in that fashion.
Now, this presents a rather unique problem because what we have over here is a representation of a number of rather independent operations having nothing to do with one another that we assume can take place concurrently. The operations are the reading of information from one card reader, examination of the type of data it is, examination of the input uh, uh, devices that may be required to be mounted, uh, information that must be retrieved from the libraries and so forth. Uh, the same type of operation from this reader, but an independent one, controlled by the speed of this card reader rather than the first. An independent printing operation there and another one uh, below it. And finally, the fifth operation, the uh, production of the, or the processing of the main program uh, after reading input data from the disk file. So we have here depicted, in fact, five completely independent operations, five different requirements for the computer to do in some fashion concurrently. The definition, or rather a word that we use to describe the situation or to describe each of these work requirements is a task. And it's a word that is in very common use within the control program because indeed, as we shall see in a moment, uh, we uh, are organized in order to manage tasks. A task is a work requirement for the computer. It n isn't necessarily, I may point out, uh, a particular program, but it's rather a particular program operating upon a particular set of data. So that, for example, the program which reads uh, and manipulates the data coming from this card reader may be identical to the program that is reading and manipulating the data coming from this card reader. I have possibly two copies of the same program, possibly in a way that we shall also talk about later, uh, I might use precisely the same program. But I still have two independent tasks. There are two work requirements, even though there's one program. And this is the essential difference between uh, a task and a program. A task uses a program in combination with data in order to produce work. The task is a requirement for work to be produced by the computer. Now, while we have this picture here, there are some of the services that, the, uh, that can be illustrated that the control program produces. Primarily among them is device independence. By device independence, we imply the ability of a programmer to indicate th that he wants to use a certain type of device that is to be accessed in a certain way. For example, that the data is to be read sequentially or the data is to be addressed in some direct fashion, such as might be the case on if the data was stored on a disk. But we do not require the programmer, the time that he writes the program, to in fact identify precisely which device he plans to use. And in fact, what happens is that within the job stream, within the initial information provided with, uh, from each one of these readers, there at that time, for the first time, is the identification of the particular uh, input-output device that is to be associated with the job. And during the execution of the program, it's the combination of what the programmer has specified together with information that was provided on control cards that allows the control program to at that time construct the channel program that will be used to service the particular I.O. device that has been selected. Uh, and along with this, by the way, is, uh, by when we say service the I.O. device, we mean not only the reading of information from the device, but also standard error correcting techniques should there be some failure in the device. As new applications are introduced at the installation, it may be necessary that the particular card readers or particular printers that were initially installed need to be replaced by other models. And this replacement can be done without any change whatsoever in the programs that, the, uh, that have been prepared at the installation. This is a tremendous savings in terms of the investment that most installations have in their programming libraries. I might say one additional extension of this concept of device independence uh, relates uh, to the use of communications facilities. Because one of the characteristics that is provided within the control program is the fact that the handling of communication lines, the handling of, of terminals, is a matter that's completely divorced from the data that actually uh, comes into the system and is used by the system. So that, in fact, uh, instead of having a card reader here, we can even replace this with a terminal. The control program will always have available the particular programs that uh, must be used in order to support particular devices. This is all safeguarded, masked away from uh, the applications programmers, though. Um, all right, what we've just been talking about now 
as another means of increasing uh, systems throughput and at the same time getting turnaround time is essentially the spool operation. I want to point out one other thing, however. I mentioned before that what we're interested in doing in, is to get turnaround time and therefore have the facility to use the disk in the way that we've already described. On the other hand, this is in a sense conceptual because I could get precisely the same effect if that file was available to another computer. In other words, my picture, my story remains the same even though the picture changes to look like this. And what we have now depicted is a, essentially a uh, peripheral computer that's handling the initial input, putting it out on the disk, handling output put, uh, on the disk, and putting it out to printers in just the same way we described, but with access to that disk by a completely independent CPU that can do the main processing. Functionally, this is precisely the same as the picture that we had before without this CPU. And the actual choice as to whether we have an attached peripheral equipment of this sort or a single computer uh, depends primarily upon the workload of, on the CPU and the economics of the situation. Now still, using this picture as uh, a means to talk about additional services, which I guess I should start enumerating here, An additional set of services that is quite significant is the library facilities that are offered within the control program. We've talked about the introduction of jobs and job steps at certain input sources. Now, the fact is that an installation regularly runs essentially the same type of information. This is the same payroll program, and you know, day after day or week after week, we always run the same sequence of programs. If this is the case, then there is no requirement to use, in fact, all of the control cards that make all of the specifications of the particular libraries and data sets uh, that must be employed of the particular programs that must be used. Indeed, that entire set of instructions represented by the control cards is information that can be cataloged on the disk. And the only input is merely something that says execute process named alpha or some such thing as that. By naming the process, the entire uh, collection of instructions having to do with the identification of the step-by-step -step procedure in the process uh, can be retrieved from the library and can be placed on the disk. And from the time it's on the disk, it looks exactly as it might have looked had it in been introduced card by card or item by item from the card readers or terminals. I might say, by the way, the reason that I talk primarily about card readers and terminals is that information basically must initially somehow or other be keyed. And uh, we, we don't necessarily think of using a tape input here, because how did we get onto tape? We got onto tape by starting off with some initial keyed data. And this either means keying it into a card punch machine and uh, then reading it, or it means keying it in, in at a terminal. If, on the other hand, uh, an application was such that uh, perhaps the installation is on the East Coast, but the data is produced on the West Coast, and perhaps just for mailing purposes, uh, a card to tape conversion might indeed take place. And there's no reason, therefore, that I could not have a tape input here as well as the card input. And once again, the program that is used to process this tape, to collect the job control information and to place it on the disk, and the program that's used for this card reader is precisely the same program. It's uh, here where I IBM is saving itself money because it's producing that program anyway. But even the IBM program now takes advantage of the device independence provided as a standard feature. So this single program is used in a number of different instances with different devices. The benefit to the user for such a uh, procedure is the fact that there's less core that's used uh, in this operation. The same copy of the code can be used despite the fact that it may be simultaneously servicing a number of different devices of different types. <coughs> While we are on the subject of library management from the point of view of naming a process, uh, there are some additional things that might be mentioned. For example, what 
is provided by the control program is extensive cataloging and indexing facilities which allow uh, a, a programmer to specify that he wants a certain routine to be drawn from a certain library. Now the fact is there may be a number of libraries that the installation provides. There may be a, a general installations library. The user or the particular programmer, however, may have his own private library and wherever uh, he has one version of a certain type of routine, he would like his copy of the routine, his version, to be used instead of the installation's version. What there is a capability for within the system then is for each programmer to name a sequence of libraries in preferential order. And he may then specify that he wants that program named Joe to be drawn from the first library that contains it. The program itself again now just talks in terms of the name Joe. And therefore initially, perhaps before he got the idea to uh, make this replacement for his own purposes, he was using the Joe that was on the systems library. When he does decide to make the change, he identifies the new library by control cards and the replacement is made. His copy of Joe, his version of Joe is used instead of the installation's version. Another instance of the facility with which we may use a library uh, has to do with generations of data. Again, taking the case of the payroll application, the payroll master file is something that we may talk about, but we're actually talking about a number of different things, because every time the payroll master file is updated, we recognize a new generation, a new version of the payroll file. And it's quite common in, in, uh, in some applications to always want, for example, the last version, or sometimes perhaps to want the last version and the one just before that and to, in some fashion, use these two versions in order to produce a third. Well, some of the library facilities provided allow you to do this. In other words, a program can make reference to last or next to last or any such relative version of any particular named collection of data. And this collection is regularly updated. As new versions are created and placed on the library, uh, the references are also updated. And last will always indeed mean the last one that was entered into the library. I'd like to return now to another consideration regarding systems throughput. We've so far talked of the fact that uh, throughput can be increased when we are using sequential files by uh, the control program's ability to look ahead in the sequential file and have material that is required available when it is needed. On the other hand, there are some applications where this, by the very nature of the application, is impossible. For example, supposing it is true that uh, we have a number of, supposing we're, we're talk, we talk about an inventory problem. Now, one of the things that might happen with such an inventory problem in certain applications is that uh, inventory records, that is to say, deletions from the inventory piles and replacements, uh, may occur throughout the day. And once a day, they, these may be collected, may be sorted. And this sorted transaction file may then be matched against a sorted master file. As long as these two files are sorted, then we can proceed in sequential fashion using the techniques that we've already described. On the other hand, supposing that the transactions are such and the inventory is such that we demand a real-time response. For example, the number of seats available on a flight, an air flight, uh, is indeed an inventory problem. The question is, are there any seats on flight 29 or are there not? And if there is one, at least one left, let me have it and deplete that particular uh, seat from your inventory records. Now clearly, we can't have various uh, ticket agencies all turning in their requests for flights and collecting these at the end of the day and eventually determining whether or not seats were available. Here is an application which demands immediate access to central files. We don't have the facility, because of the real-time characteristics of the problem, to sort the transaction files. So what must we do? First of all, the implication is that we must use a direct access device, a disk of some fashion, disk or drum, and that the centralized inventory files must reside on the disk. But what happens now is that when a transaction is received, since the uh, access mechanism may be some distance from the actual record that's to be retrieved, there's of necessity a delay between the time that the, a particular record is asked for and the time that that record may be retrieved. 
And what this implies, therefore, is that unless we do something about this, there will be very large gaps in uh, the computing. We'll be doing a little bit of computing, then require this very long seek time, or relatively long seek time, before the record is retrieved. If we should insist upon just doing, just processing that single transaction to completion, we've destroyed any systems throughput that we attempted to achieve earlier. And how then can we take care of this? The only way uh, under this particular circumstance of real-time processing against a centralized inventory file with no possibility of sorting your transactions is indeed to process a large number of transactions simultaneously. So the point is, in such systems, uh, <coughs> if there are a number of independent messages coming into the system, each one requesting uh, some particular information about the inventory file, what we cannot do is to process one to completion and then go on to the second and then go on to the third. Instead, we must begin the processing of the first on to the point where the seek is given. And while the computer is effectively idling, begin processing of the next transaction. And begin then, uh, when the second message has gone to the point of its seek, begin processing the third and back to the first, perhaps, by that time. The point is that we must be able to concurrently handle a large number of transactions at the same time. Now, this fits in beautifully with a situation that we've already described, because what we had over here was a number of independent tasks, as we've already defined it. That task which says we must go from this card reader onto the disk, or from the other, another card reader, or from a tape onto the disk, and from the disk onto the printer, and so forth. And I've already implied that we do have the facility to be able, in some fashion, to concurrently keep track of all of the various independent requirements that uh, the system is asked to take care of. Well, th this environment of real-time message processing, of inventory control, of process control, all fits exactly into this uh, type of arrangement. Because associated with each independent message that comes in, we will establish an independent task. And once having established this processing requirement as a task, the general structure of the control program allows us to operate all such tasks on a priority basis. Now, the implication, first of all, here is that so far we've just talked about tasks that have been established by the control program itself for effectively its own uses, the utilization of these particular resources. But this same tool, that is the ability to create uh, a new task and let uh, the responsible parts of the control program know of its existence, is also available to the user by means of a macro. So that anywhere within a user's code, and let this represent the code, the user can specify the, the, by the macro attach the fact that he now wants to instigate an entirely new and independent process. So the point here is that the user's program may have been the program that received uh, for the first time data from the communication line. That is to say it passed through the control program programs that manipulated the lines and it now has been presented to the user as a piece of data. The user can examine the data, determine the particular action that he wants taken on the data, for example, the identification of the program, that is to continue with the processing, then specify attach, naming the program, and let me just indicate that with the N, naming the priority, and naming any other uh, uh, characteristics, any other parameters that are associated with the particular task that is at this time being uh, created. And having done so, the uh, that new program will now appear as an independent block within the system, and the system will be able to process this quite independently of the original user's program in which the attach was issued. So in a typical environment, for example, after having attached, what may well happen is that the program loops back and is now ready to receive the next uh, message, and it will follow this operation and attach a new task, uh, that is to say will create a new task for each subsequent message that comes along. Now, I've so far said that this is what we can do. I'd like now to talk about how we do this. What we, I want to talk about right now is task management. How does the control program keep track of the variety of different uh, work uh, requirements that have been placed upon it?
the individual programs within the control program uh, can be looked upon as being uh, managers of the various resources that are available in the system. Uh, any particular task, as we've defined it, can feel free to ask for any amount of resources that it cares to. It can, as it can ask if it chooses for all of the resources of a particular kind. But um, the actual management of the resources, the tending to uh, other various requests and competing requests in some cases of the various tasks, this is all managed by the control program. The individual task, in other words, asks for whatever it wants, and it may assume that when it asks for it, it will get it. The control program will, in fact, determine whether the resource should be granted immediately or whether uh, it will have to be deferred because of a higher priority demand. And this, I hope, will become clear in just a moment. All right, what are some of these resources that uh, these various routines are managing? One of them we've already talked about, and that's that resource which consists of channel time. And let me just put this down on a box. We've discussed this when we said that uh, an individual program can ask for any um, number of uh, records on the assumption that these records are available. And it's the control program itself, however, that makes the records available. And how does it do so? There may be a number of different competing requests on a particular channel. It's the control program that will determine which particular request shall be honored and when it shall be honored and will then grant that channel time be assigned to a particular task. The most important of the resources, however, is not channel time, but CPU time itself. What we have here are a number of tasks which are competing for the CPU. They all want to use it. Now, it turns out that they don't all want to use it all of the time, and that's the thing that we're going to take advantage of. But the fact is that when they do want to use the CPU, it's the CPU re time resource manager that makes the allocation and determines which of the several tasks shall have it at any particular instant. Uh, other requirements now, since we are talking of competing tasks with a possibility at, that different tasks uh, exist at different times, with the possibility that uh, a task that's in memory may one day or one minute find that the, its, its uh, programs and data cells are located in one place in core, and at some other time, it may be loaded and uh, established in some other place in core. The fact that the memory map doesn't look the same from instant to instant, from day to day, because of the variety of different kinds of tasks that may be sharing the resources of the system, this demands that we have an allocator of core. core is dynamically allocated upon the request of a program by use of a special macro that says get core. When a particular program requires core for working space, for example, or requires a uh, space in which to load a new program or a subroutine that it cares to use, the request is made for core by use of such a macro. Other resources um, would be the use of space on the file. So that uh, when, for example, a particular quantity of information is uh, created, if it's desired to catalog this information and to place it on the file so that at some later time uh, it can be retrieved, then we have a space allocator, a space allocator for the file. Space is asked for, again, by macro, and uh, space is granted. The location of the space, the management of the resource, the, the responsibility for efficient utilization of the total resources is the responsibility of the control program. The individual user merely makes the demand and can assume that before he proceeds uh, that this demand will indeed be granted, which raises another point, by the way. Generally speaking, uh, any time within a line of code that the user makes a request for a resource. The implication is that at that time, the system is alerted to the fact that he requires the resource. But he may not indeed be demanding it at that time. As an example, uh, the user may say, read for me from the direct access device 
the inventory information you have on flight 29. On the other hand, there may be additional code that that particular user can go through prior to the time that he requires it and can't proceed until he gets it. When he reaches such a point, he again notifies the supervisor of this by the macro wait. And this is a general macro that will be used over and over again. This was a request for a resource. Wait is, in a sense, a demand for the resource, saying, I cannot continue unless the resource is granted to me. And so in some particular instances, and get core happens to be such a case, uh, these two types of macros are coalesced into a single one. So in other words, when a man says get core, this is an implied wait. It, the implication of get core is that he wants core immediately. And if core isn't available immediately, then he would like to wait until it is available. Now, how is this handled? We have these resource managers. There are other resource managers as well. But this will be sufficient to illustrate the point. At a given point in time, there may be, as we have already indicated, a number of independent tasks all waiting for CPU time. They all say they can use it, and they can use it now. These tasks are arranged in priority sequence. And if this were the picture at the time that we take a look at things, why the CPU time manager would turn control over to the ranking task, and these tasks are arranged in priority sequence. So that particular task, which has been declared by the user to be most important, is the p task to which control will be turned. So we now are executing within this code. During the execution of the code, a request for additional resources may be made. Let's say this is task capital A, this is task capital B, capital C, capital D. Uh, this is the uh, a representation of the tasks that are waiting for CPU time. They are all ready for CPU time, and time must be allocated. They would be arranged in priority sequence, and the manager of CPU time would therefore turn control over to task A. And the, the CPU now is executing task A. Along with the execution of this, however, or within the execution, uh, supposing that the program demands uh, some channel time. It wants to retrieve some information from some I.O. device or, or place information on it. At that time, a new control block is created, which I will denote with a little a, uh, that is associated with the requesting task. And it's placed on the queue for the appropriate resource manager. There may at this time have been other ta uh, such control blocks also on the queue, and this would be placed in its proper sequence. On the other hand, so far in the story, uh, the request has been made for it, but not the demand. Now the demand is made. In other words, within, as task A continues in its execution, uh, a wait is issued. And because of the wait, the task declares that unless this particular uh, requirement that was uh, symbolized and, and controlled by this particular um, block here, unless that request has been satisfied, it can no longer use the CPU. Under those circumstances, let's assume that the request has not yet been satisfied, it removes itself from the uh, ready queue and is placed in a wait status. Uh, from the point of view of the CPU time uh, manager now, what it wants to do is to turn control over to the next highest priority task. And in this case, it's task B. So control is turned over to task B. Along the way, task B may itself be uh, making a number of different requests for uh, other resource managers, and control blocks will be created associated with it. So I might have one over here, I might have one over here, and so on. And uh, perhaps it didn't yet reach that point where it wants to make a uh, demand. Now, while it's still executing, uh, in D, just because of the types of channels that uh, we may be on, perhaps this particular request will have been uh, uh, satisfied first. So at that time, the request is removed from the channel time queue, and information is posted within control blocks associated with B, telling it that the, its requirement on channel time has been satisfied. And B is still being executed, however. Uh, while it's executing, another interrupt may occur, indicating that space on the file has been allocated. And at that time, this request is removed from the queue, 
And again, information is posted within the uh, task control block indicated up here, saying that that second request has also been satisfied. Now, when the demand is made by B, saying, I must have those things that I asked for, the control program will recognize that, in fact, those particular resources have been granted, and B will be allowed to continue. Supposing B continues, and in fact continues to completion, at the time that B finishes, it's entirely removed from the queue waiting for CPU time, and the manager of CPU time again looks for the highest priority task which is ready. In this case, then, it's task C which is given control. And task C is now the active task and will begin its execution. Now, while it's executing, however, another interrupt may occur. And that interrupt will perhaps be the response of the system to this request here. Channel time uh, had been granted to A. The information that was desired has been brought into core. This request was completed. And therefore, the request block is removed from the queue. And the information is posted in the control block associated with task A. And A is now removed from the wait state. So the situation that we've just described is that C was executing. And while it was executing, an interrupt occurred indicating that the resource requirements of A had been satisfied. And once again, we go to the supervisor or the manager of CPU time to decide what shall we do next. And from its point of view, it will follow the same rule as it always had. It will go to the first ready task on the queue. And therefore, control will now be uh, returned to task A, leaving C in a suspended state. It's been interrupted. But on the other hand, all of the information associated with C has been saved. The status of registers, the pointers to data blocks, the pointers to programs, and so forth. All of the control information has, in a sense, been frozen and is recorded within the control block associated with task C. And we return now to task A. Task A, let's say, completes. At that time, it's removed from the ready queue. And uh, the same rule again is followed. And the manager of CPU time says, well, what is there now to do? And it finds that it's task C, which is now to be uh, performed. It will determine where within the execution of task C it had been before and will resume the execution at precisely that point. The programmer who wrote this, the programs associated with task C, let me point out, needs, is entirely unaware of the fact that uh, at some point in the execution of his code, uh, an interrupt will have occurred, which might have removed him uh, completely from uh, an executing state, perhaps for a, a period of several minutes, in fact, and that at a later time, uh, he will once again regain control. The program is completely insulated, in other words, from these various happenings. The placing on the ready queue, the removal from the ready queue, interrupts the occurrence and readying of higher priority tasks and so forth. I'd like now to summarize the remarks that I've said so far. The three main responsibilities of the control program are those that are listed here. Systems throughput, improving systems throughput, uh, decreasing turnaround time and providing certain special services of particular significance to the user. Within this general framework, we can identify at least two, uh, two other areas. One of them is data management. And the other is task management. Now, by data management, I mean essentially three things. One is device independence. Secondly, providing for buffered input and output. And lastly, providing rather extensive library services. Now, I'd like just to emphasize another point on the library services, that what we provide is the capability of identifying and naming and cataloging uh, information, putting them out on 
uh, other devices, and at a later time, by naming them and by indicating uh, the directory hierarchy in which they're cataloged under, retrieving them. From the point of view of the programs themselves, however, which manage uh, this service of library uh, uh, services, they don't care what the characteristics of the data are. That is to say, they don't care what the particular collection of characters uh, represent or mean, or they don't care how these, th this information is going to be used once it's brought into core. From their point of view, there is merely a named data set which they put away and later on retrieve. But how the information is used is of no concern to them. Uh, how it's used is something that won't be uh, needed until the, uh, the requester, the, the particular user of library services, is informed that the data is in fact now in core. It's that uh, requester of library services which will now take advantage of the particular characteristics of the data and either use it uh, as pure data, for example, a table of information or a uh, sequence of control cards or a payroll file or some such thing, or uh, a particular program out of his library, out of a general systems library. It's the user that knows what the data is used for. Library services merely knows that it is data. It is a collection of characters. It has a name. It is cataloged in a certain fashion. The second general category uh, that is provided by control programs is that of task management. And by task management, what we refer to is the uh, recognition of independent work requests that exist within the system and the allocation of resources to those independent tasks. Resource allocation and we can say task identification. Now, over and above these specific functions that we have already discussed, there are several more general remarks that can be made that characterize uh, the control program that we've produced. Primary among these is that the system is modular. And by this, what we really mean is that during the construction, during the, the design of the control program, we've been particularly sensitive to the fact that not all users want precisely the same functions. The different users have different requirements, and what's good for one user is not necessarily of any use to a second user. The system is, is designed as much as possible recognizing which functions may or may not be needed and which can be deleted. May, and also which functions perhaps uh, are provided but aren't provided in precisely the same way. So in some cases, the same function may actually be represented by two different routines and the user can pick whichever one is most suited to his environment. And in addition, if the user has uh, particular requirements which were not recognized by control programs, then the way in which that particular function is included in the system is such so as to facilitate the user supplying his own version of that particular function. The second point, let me perhaps record some of these more general points. The second point is compatibility. Now, it's already fairly well known uh, that the operating system 360 hardware, excuse me, that's the 360, the uh, computer system 360, uh, has been designed with compatibility very much in mind. We have a number of different models of CPUs, and they, they characteristically are different because one is faster than the next. And uh, despite this, despite the rather wide range of speeds, what is guaranteed by the hardware that if a pro is that if a program is written to run under one model, then given the same core size and given the same uh, channel capacity and barring any time-dependent requirements on the part of the program, that program which was written to run on one computer will one model will run on another model. Uh, another dimension of compatibility is provided by control programs, and this has to do now with space rather than speed, because. We start off in, in some of the smallest of the versions of the operating system control program with uh, a program that, for example, does not provide the multi-programming capability that we talked about, but does, does provide device independence and does provide um, a buffered input-output and uh, uh, job uh, sequencing. The third function is a rather clean separation
between resource management and processors. Another way of saying the same thing is that the individual user, generally speaking, is made completely unaware. The burden of being aware of the environment in which he's operating, of the devices that he has, of whether the information is coming over communication lines, of the fact that he is sharing core with other users or sharing channel time and so forth, uh, is completely irrelevant from the point of view of the installation programmer. He can turn and devote his entire attention to solving the problems of the installation. And he doesn't have to worry at all about making maximum use of the uh, resources that is provided within his installation. Uh, there's a clean separation between these two. And as a matter of fact, just to point out what, is, what may be significant in comparison with other systems, this separation is true whether, whether we're talking about processors or programs that were produced by the installation or whether we're talking about processors that were produced by IBM. So that Fortran, for example, and COBOL and SORT uh, and RPG have precisely the same relationship with respect to the control program as the installations programs. There is a clean separation. Uh, the IBM provided programs are treated in precisely the same way as the user's programs. The fourth point is our support of the uh, hardware protection scheme. This is particularly important in a multi-programmed environment. If we do have a large number of tasks being executed concurrently, there is always a danger that one of the programs involved is not completely debugged and may possibly destroy some of the information or actually destroy uh, the programs that don't belong to that task, that have nothing to do with it, that are completely independent of it. Hardware has provided for a protection facility and this protection facility is used by the control program to safeguard one task, to insulate one task from all other tasks. So in this fashion, if, if indeed any one task should not be executing correctly, then the most that can happen is that that same task can destroy itself. It cannot destroy other tasks with which it coexists. And lastly, a thing that we consider to be quite noteworthy is that we believe that we have identified the essential components of any control program. And this has built, been built in a, in a very flexible general structure. It's the kind of structure that we anticipate will provide the minimum impact as either the installation or IBM support goes on to more exotic types of applications, real-time applications, multiprocessing applications. We expect both for IBM and for the installation that such transitions by use of this control program can be made with a minimum amount of work. Thus, the structure of the control program opens to the user a new avenue of growth. <laughs>